In the last section, uh, I introduced the partial derivative. And so it might occur to you, well, if, that's, if those are the partial derivatives, what's the whole derivative? And that's what is answered in this section. There's something called, well, it's not called the whole derivative. It's called the total derivative. It's um, a little unwieldy because it's, uh, the total derivative is no at a point is no longer a number. It's a function. Why is it a function? Well, you think of the partial derivatives as telling you instantaneous rates of change in um, very specific directions as you move in specific directions, like parallel to the coordinate axes, which means you let one variable change and hold all the others fixed. In, for the total derivative, you want to say, OK, I want the derivative at a point. And I want it to tell me the instantaneous rate of change as I move in any direction whatsoever. That means the derivative itself is a function of the direction and the speed. Um, so it's a function of a velocity vector. And so that complicates matters, but not a ridiculous amount. So that's what we're doing. Um, so let me discuss the partial derivative in a way that I didn't in the last section. So suppose you have. Let's just take the easy case of a function of two variables. We can do this for any number of variables, but let's, let's look at two. That would be enough. Suppose you want the partial derivative of f with respect to x. All right. Remember, that's the instantaneous rate of change of f with respect to x holding y constant. So in terms of limits, you could do this. You could have done this in cal calculus 1. We'll take the limit usually used an h in calc, in calc 1. I like using a t here because it makes me think of time. You can call it h. You can call it banana. You can call it whatever you want. But take the limit as t approaches 0, f of, you let the x-coordinate change, but you keep the y-coordinate fixed at y. So this is what the partial derivative is. You take a small change just in the x-coordinate. You leave the y-coordinate fixed. You divide by the corresponding change in the x-coordinate, and you take the limit as t approaches 0. Great. Well, let's write that in vector-looking terms. This is the limit as t approaches 0 of f of the vector xy plus, well, plus a t0, a t comma 0, minus f of xy all over t. But then you can. You can rewrite this part. The vector t0, well, you can pull out the scalar t. So this is t times the vector 1, 0. And 1, 0 is one of our standard basis vectors. We usually call that one i. So this is the limit as t approaches 0 of f of xy plus t times the vector i minus f of xy all divided by t. When you write it like this, it, it's kind of natural to think of the partial derivative as ah, It's the instantaneous rate of change of f when I'm at the point xy and I move in the direction of the vector i. And in fact, if you recall what we did earlier um, in chapter 1, is t, uh, as t changes, this xy plus ti defines points on a line. And um, if you think of t as the time, you could think of this, uh, and you think of this as the position of a particle, then the derivative of, of this part with respect to t is just i, so that if you think of this as the position, its derivative with respect to time would be the velocity. And so the velocity vector here would be i. And so one way to think of this is, is as this is the instantaneous rate of change of f at xy when you move with velocity i, or u, or the point when the point
Well, after you realize that, it should seem very natural to you to just put other vectors here. What is the instantaneous rate of change of f when you're at the point, at some point, and you move with an arbitrary velocity vector? Or the point moves with an arbitrary velocity vector. And that's what the total derivative is. So um, you have a function f. It could be a function of any number of variables. You take a point p. coordinates, a point P, um, you have a, a vector V, which in coordinates is the V1 through Vn. And what we'd like to look at is something that I'll write as D sub P of F. So read this, the total derivative of F at P with respect to the velocity vector v, or you can say in the direction of v, but direction should is defined by a unit vector, and we want to allow for arbitrary velocity. So if you say in the direction of the velocity vector v, you know, that's a little bad. It was better to say the, the total derivative of f at p um, with respect to velocity vector v. So this equals the total derivative of f at p with respect to the, and I'm going to put velocity in quotes, we'll have, as I'll talk about later, there, you can think of it as velocity, but there are times when that wouldn't seem very natural with respect to the velocity vector v. And what we'd like for it to be or equals, and I need to put this in quotes and say some words about it. We, it should be, the limit is t approaches 0 of f of p, but now thought of as a vector, plus tv minus f of p, which I don't care if we think about this as a vector, on the other hand, after I've written that this one's a vector so that I could add the scalar multiple of a vector, it seems kind of natural to write that one there too. All divided by t. That's what we want. So that it is the instantaneous, so it equals the instantaneous rate of change of f at p as p moves with velocity v. Well, so this is what we're after, and I'm going to give, give you a formula so that we can calculate this easily. But I should say why this equals sign is in quotes. This is not this, while it's kind of generally how we think of the total derivative, there's a more technical definition because this has p plus tv as t approaches 0, this approaches p, but it approaches p along the straight line defined parameterized by p plus tv. So uh, really the technical definition of the total derivative requires that you examine how this other point moves towards p uh, regardless of how it does it. So it just uh, doesn't have to move along a straight line. It just has to be close to p and get closer and closer to p. Um, it is not terribly difficult to define it. That way, it's a little abstract, a little technical. Uh, it's certainly in the book, um, <clears throat> but I'm not going to do that now. Um, but the reason this equals is here is the existence of this limit is not all that you need for the total derivative to exist. You need 
for a certain limit to exist regardless of how this approaches p. And this isn't how you would define the derivative, the total derivative, even when it exists, but it's close. So, <clears throat> but in practice, this is how you think of it most of the time, and, and there's a criterion that tells you when dpf exists, so when f is differentiable at p, that's what everybody uses all the time, and that one's easy to state. So let me state that theorem. Theorem. Suppose that all of the partial derivatives of f exist and are continuous. Total derivative DPF um, exists, or we say, I maybe this is the same as saying F is differentiable at P. Total derivative of f p with respect to the any velocity vector v is given by that formula. So if the partial derivatives exist, then in fact this limit does give you the total derivative. And the nice formula for it is that it is the gradient vector of f at p dotted with the velocity vector v. So written out, that means that you take the, all the partial derivatives of f evaluated at p times the corresponding component of the vector v. So it's So you get this for the total derivative. And this makes it, you know, you, if the partial derivatives exist and are continuous, and, and, and essentially every case that we'll look at, that will be true, then to calculate the total derivative, you simply calculate the gradient, so the vector of all the partial derivatives of the function at the point, and then dot that with the velocity vector. Um, we will look at this in the more deeply in the specific case where v is a unit vector in the section on directional derivatives. But right now I just want to do a few basic examples with the, the total derivative. Um, so, basic examples. <clears throat> well, the first one, just Be sure. So an example. This one's a little. <laughs> this one might seem a little silly. Um, suppose f is differentiable. At, uh, suppose 
partial derivatives. Uh, let me give this. Let me give this a name that all of the partial derivatives of f exist and are continuous in the neighborhood of p. Um, we frequently say f is c1 or of class c1. And c1 means continuously first differentiable, and it means the first derivatives exist. The first partial derivatives exist and are continuous. Uh, just saves us having to write that phrase over and over again that all the partial derivatives exist and are continuous in a neighborhood. We just say the function is C1 at P. <clears throat> at P, when you in this context, means that something happens in a neighborhood of P. So suppose, suppose F is C1 at P. All the partial derivatives exist and are continuous. But then, then f is differentiable at p by the theorem. And my question is, what is the total derivative of f at p with respect to one of our standard basis vectors, e sub i? So this is the i standard basis vector, just reminding you. It's the vector that has a 1 in the ith coordinate and in the ith component and a 0 every place else. So what is this? Well, <laughs> if things are working right, we kind of arrived at our definition or kind of arrived at part of our definition of the total derivative by saying, hey, here's what happens for partial derivatives. Let's generalize that. Well, we generalized it, and now we're back to where we were with um, it's, hey, I want the instantaneous rate of change of f at p when I move in the direction of the velocity vector ei. That better give us the partial derivative with respect to i. Well, the, the formula that I wrote is that you should take the gradient of f at p and dot with the velocity vector, which here is ei. This means, of course, you're taking the vector of partial derivatives of f evaluated at t, and then you're dotting with this vector that's all zeros until the ith position. Let me write it so. And then all zeros after that. Okay, so this is in the ith position. What do you get when you take the dot product? You multiply the corresponding entries and you add. Well, you get zeros every place, except in the ith component where you get 1 times the ith thing here. Well, that's the partial derivative of f with respect to x sub i evaluated at p. Good. <laughs> Good. This the total derivative in the direction of one of the, with respect to one of the standard basis vectors by this formula, yes, comes out to be the partial derivative of f with respect to i, or xi. Well, that's good. Um, all right, what's another, what's, what's a new example? Not using this to somehow return to something we've already looked at. So, another example, let me do one, uh, do a bunch, straight out of the book. I want f of x, y, so f of x, y, be x cosine of pi, y, plus z, uh, no, plus y squared e to the x x because of pi y plus y squared. And then let's find, let's calculate the total derivative at the point minus 1, 1. But 
with respect to two different vectors. Up here, let's do this with respect to the vector 4 minus 2. And down here, let's do this with respect to the vector minus 3, 5. So we'd like to calculate the value of the total derivative. So the total derivative is this function. Maybe I should make that clear. The, the total derivative of f at minus 1, 1 is the function that you give a vector to. So a vector with as many components as the number of variables in f. So this will be a function from r2, and it's giving me back a real number. Um, which you can interpret physically as the instantaneous rate of change of f when you're at this point, when you're at the point, in this example, minus 1, 1, and the point is moving with different velocities. Here the velocity vector 4 minus 2, and here velocity minus 3, 5. And it, you give it any velocity vector, any pair of real numbers, and it gives you back a real number representing the corresponding instant, instantaneous rate of change. How do you calculate these? Well, the theorem says that uh, certainly all the partial derivatives of this are continuous everywhere. So the theorem says you calculate the gradient of f at minus 1, 1 and dot it with 4 minus 2. And here you take the gradient of f at minus 1, 1 and dot it with uh, minus 3, 5. Well, this means that you, you don't redo this work twice. When you're looking at the total derivative at a point, the gradient vector, if your point stays fixed and your function stays fixed, the gradient vector is staying fixed. So you calculate this once, and then you just dot it with two different vectors to get your result. So we want the gradient vector of f. Okay, the gradient vector is the vector of partial derivatives. So let me rewrite f so it's more convenient for me to refer to. It is x cosine of pi y. x cosine of pi y plus y squared e to the x. The, the gradient vector is the partial derivative with respect to x. So that is cosine of pi y. Right, the, y is a constant, cosine of pi y is a constant as far as x is concerned, so this is just x times a constant, the derivative with respect to x. You just pick up the constant, the derivative of this part with respect to x. The y squared is a constant, and the derivative of e to the x with respect to x is just e to the x. So there's the partial derivative of f with respect to x, and then you need the partial derivative of f with respect to y. The rest of the great right, so I should write this. The partial derivative of this with respect to y. Now you think of x as a constant. So you get minus x. Uh, actually, when you take the derivative of this part with respect to y, you get minus sine of pi y. But then by the chain rule, um, you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside with respect to y. So you pick up a minus pi. Uh, so you pick up a pi. So we get minus pi sine. So I'm going to put the minus pi out in front for aesthetic beauty, minus pi x sine of pi y. Um, so that's the partial of this part with respect to y plus 2y e to the x. This is partial of f with respect to y. OK, so that's the gradient vector at an arbitrary point x, y. We want this at minus 1, 1. So you put in x is minus 1 and y is 1. All right. When y is 1, you get the cosine of pi. Cosine of pi minus 1 plus 1 squared to 1. Okay, I'll write 1 squared. Times e to the minus 1. Because um, you put in x is minus 1. Comma. All right, we get minus pi times x. x is minus 1, so we get pi times the sine of, well, in fact, I didn't need to bother doing that because we're putting in y as 1. The sine, so here we get the sine of pi. The sine of pi is 0, so this part is 0. 
we're going to get plus 2 times 1 times e to the minus 1. So our gradient vector is coming out to be minus 1 plus e to the minus 1, comma, 2e to the minus 1. All right. And then that means over here, you just have to take this dot product, these dot products. So over here, this is minus 1 plus, plus e to the minus 1, comma, 2e to the minus 1 dotted with 4 minus 2. So you get 4 times this, so you get this times this plus this times this. So you get minus 4 plus 4 e to the minus 1. And then minus 4 e to the minus 1. So you just get these cancel and you just get minus 4. So instantaneous rate of change of f when you're at the point minus 1, 1 and move in the direction of the velocity vector 4 minus 2, and with speed given by the magnitude of that vector, um, is minus 4. On the other hand, when you move in the, with respect to the vector minus 3, 5, or in the, in the direction with the speed given by the vector minus 3, minus, uh, minus 3, 5, you get, well, you have the same gradient vector. You have the same gradient vector, and it's now just dotted with a different vector. Minus 3, 5, you get whatever you get. I don't know, what do you get? You get 3 minus 3e to the minus 1 um, plus 10e to the minus 1. So you get 3 plus 7e to the minus 1. Not as attractive as just getting an integer for an answer, but hey, that's what you get. Um, so that's, a, that's an easy example of calculating the total derivative uh, with respect to a couple of different velocity vectors. What's, um, what's a more um, interesting example? You could, you, uh, a physical example where you need to know about rates of change. So, example. Suppose that space, so x, y, z space, suppose that space is heated in such a way, it's going to take a lot longer to write all these words than it will take to do the problem, but oh well. It's the way it is with word problems frequently. Suppose that space is heated in such a way that the temperature in degrees Celsius um, is given by T x, y, z equals z squared plus 0.5 times e to the x squared minus y squared, um, <clears throat> where x, y, and z are all strictly between minus 2 and 2 and are measured in meters. Um, if a particle is at the point Um, actually, uh, let me change this to minus 3 and 3. 
Um, okay. If a particle is at the point uh, P equals 0, 1, 2, and it's moving, with velocity v equals 3 minus 1, 0 meters per second when, not necessarily constantly with that velocity the whole time, but when it's at this point, when at p, at what rate? is the, the temperature around the particle changing. So there's the question. Um, it took, it took a long time to write the question, um, but what you're being asked to calculate is very simple and you're, you're set up for it. It is, you're asked for the instantaneous rate of change of the temperature function at the point 0, 1, 2 with respect to, or as, you, as the point moves with, velocity 3 minus 1, 0. So a lot of words to give a physical setting to a mathematical thing that's relatively easy to calculate. We want, we want d sub is 0, 1, 2 of t, of the temperature function, at the point, I mean, in, with respect to the velocity vector 3 minus 1, 0. Well, that's just the gradient. You just take the gradient vector of t at 0, 1, 2, and dot it with the vector 3 minus 1, 0. This vector has uniform units, so each, co each component has units of meters per second, so the vector has units of meters per second. Um, this is a vector of partial derivatives, and they have consistent units. It's degrees Celsius degrees Celsius per meter. When we take this dot product, we're going to end up with something in degrees, it's the meters will cancel and you end up with something in degrees Celsius per second. So yes, the instantaneous rate of change of the temperature with respect to time, which is what most people mean when they say um, at what rate, if they don't say with respect to what, the default is with respect to time, since everything changes with respect to time. We need the gradient of the temperature at the point 1, 0, 2. So you have to calculate some partial derivatives. They're not too bad. They're not too good, but not too bad. The gradient vector t at an arbitrary point, the partial derivative with respect to x, you get um, point, you get 0.5 times um, e to the x squared minus y squared. Then by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of this exponent with respect to x. So you pick up another 2x. So the 2 times the 0.5, you'll just get a 1, so that's nice. Um, the partial derivative with respect to y, you get 0.5e to the x squared minus y squared. But now times the derivative of the exponent with respect to y, so times a minus 2y. And then you get the partial derivative with respect to z, which is just 2z written more nicely, multiply the 2's times the 0.5, you get x e to the x squared minus y squared, comma, minus, minus y e to the x squared minus y squared, 2z, that's at an arbitrary point, at 0, 1, 2, all right, you plug in x is 0, y is 1, z is 2, if x is 0, this first component, is just zero. 
If we plug in 0, 1, 2, we get minus 1, e to the 0 minus 1, uh, minus 1, yes, comma, and then 2z, so 4. So this is just minus 1 times e to the minus 1, so minus e to the minus 1, um, and then you dot with 3 minus 1. Zero, so you multiply the corresponding components and add. This will give you a zero. This will give you a zero. All you're left with in the end is minus e to the minus one times minus one. So you get e to the minus one degrees Celsius per second. So as I said, writing all the words for the problem takes more time than doing the problem. Well, maybe it's about equal. But... All right. Um, <clears throat> I want to do another physical example where it's kind of clear that velocity, well, there's nothing, you know, there's no object that you think of as moving in space or in the plane and that this is how fast something's moving. On the other hand, it's clearly a sort of velocity vector because it's telling you the rate at which something is changing. But the something is, is different. Um, so let's do another example that'll take a while to write. So, suppose a company produces X kilograms of some chemical A and Y kilograms of chemical B. And that the cost of producing these two chemicals, cost of production in dollars, is producing x kilograms of A and y kilograms of B is 5x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. If the company is currently producing Ten kilograms of chemical A and eight kilograms of chemical B. And a lot more ands here. If the company currently producing 10 kilograms, let's put 8 kilograms of chemical A, and is uh, deep and is decreasing the production of chemical A, by one kilogram per day. But I mean at an instantaneous rate of one kilogram per day. So you shouldn't really think of this as each day they drop at one kilogram. You know, these are always instantaneous rates of change. It is decreasing the production of chemical by one kilogram per day and increasing the production of chemical B by two kilograms per day.
How fast? At what rate? is the cost of production. Where, what, at what rate is the cost changing? So again, this is one of those problems <clears throat> where it takes a long time to write all the words, and yet what you're actually being asked to calculate isn't really bad. It's um, So, so uh, you don't even need to be paying attention much to notice I'm suddenly wearing a different shirt. We, uh, I noticed, now it's, it's actually the next day from when we recorded the rest of the, the lecture, and um, I noticed that I had transposed two numbers at this point in, in this example. And so I were just recording it the next day and not recording this little bit the next day. And I'm, we're not trying to fool you by having me dress the same way and splicing it in. Um, so this was our cost function. This is our cost function um, of producing chemical A and chemical B. And I've summarized on the board the data that was on the other board yesterday that we have 10 kilograms of chemical A, or we're producing 10 kilograms of chemical A, 8 kilograms of chemical B, but we're decreasing the rate at which we produce chemical A by 1 kilogram per day and increasing the rate at which we produce chemical B by 2 kilograms per day. Um, so what we're after is the instantaneous rate of change of the cost of production of the two chemicals. That is the total derivative evaluated at the point 10, 8, so right now we're producing 10 kilograms of chemical A and 8 of chemical B. This is what I transposed <coughs> yesterday and wrote 8, 10. Uh, the instantaneous rate of change of the cost when you're at the point 10, 8, but you move with velocity given by this. Now it's not actual velocity, but it's uh, you can kind of think of it that way. It's the instantaneous rate of change of your production of the chemicals. You're decreasing chemical A by one kilogram per day. That means the instantaneous rate of change of, of X is negative one because of the decrease, while the instantaneous rate of change of Y is two kilograms per day. So this is what we want to calculate. And of course, it's the gradient of the cost evaluated at 10, 8, dotted with the vector minus 1, 2. So you need to calculate the gradient, evaluate it, the gradient vector, evaluate it at 10, 8, and then dot it with minus 1, 2. The gradient vector of C, the vector of partial derivatives, the partial derivative with respect to x, 10x plus 2y, the partial derivative with respect to y, 2x plus 2y, so the gradient of C at 10, 8 is 100 plus 16, comma, 20 plus 16. So that's 116, comma, 36. The units here, uh, the units on the partial derivatives, they're dollars per kilogram in both coordinates so that the vector has coordinates dollars per kilogram. And then the total derivative, the instantaneous rate of change of the cost at minus 1, 2 is 116, 36 dotted with minus 1, 2. These this vector is in kilograms per day. So that when we, so this is in dollars per kilogram, kilograms per day, we will end up with dollars per day. So we get minus 116 plus 72, and that is negative 44 dollars per day. 
So the instantaneous rate of change of the cost per day is negative 44, so the cost is decreasing at an instantaneous rate of $44 per day. Okay, so um, let's look at the function. The, let's look at capital Xi equals the i component function or component or coordinate function. Um, there's a little notational issue here, but I'll go ahead and write it. This is the function that if you've got a point whose coordinates are x1 through xn, the ith coordinate function picks out the ith coordinate. So it would just give you little x sub i. The notational problem here is that a lot of people use little xi to denote this function that I've denoted by capital Xi. Um, which means that any time those people write x1 through xn as the coordinates for a point, they actually mean I have some, they have some point, and they've applied these things, represent these coordinate functions applied to that point. All right. The, <laughs> it sounds a little confusing, but understand. Xi, the capital Xi is the function that picks out the ith coordinate of a point so that if you just write the formula for capital Xi in terms of variables, it's just capital Xi is little xi. Um, so don't let this bother you too much. Um, all right. So what is dp of this ith coordinate function done to a vector? All right. Well, let's suppose p is point P is x1 through xn. The vector v is some v1 through vn. What is this? Well, from the formula, you take the gradient vector of xi at P and you dot with the vector v. But this means you take the vector partial derivatives of your formula, well, you only get something in the ith coordinate. So you get 0, 0, you get a bunch of zeros, and then you get to the ith coordinate, and you get a 1, and then you get a bunch of zeros. Because the formula for this function is just that it's xi. It doesn't matter what the point p is, the gradient vector here is the ith standard basis vector. In fact, and then you dot this with this vector that's v1 through vn. Well, yeah, you can write this as ei dotted with v, but one way or the other, you multiply a bunch of zeros, and then you multiply a 1 in the ith component times the corresponding thing over there. Well, that picks out vi. So that what we conclude is that dp of xi the total derivative of xi with respect to the vector that's v1 through vn is just vi. But understand, that means that if you think of the total derivative as a function from rn to r, that it doesn't matter if we call these v's, what it does is pick out the ith component. So right, you give it a, a vector, but you can think a point in Rn, but really, I'll say, you, you, it's sometimes a mistake to think of those interchangeably as the points here, as points and vectors, because you really want to think of the Vs that you put into the total derivative as velocity vectors based at the point P. You want to think of them as velocity vectors, not really is the same points in Rn at which you're looking at velocity vectors. I realize that's a subtle point, and yet you kind of want to try to get used to thinking of those as different types of things. But if you don't, if you just think, ah, well, I give it a point in Rn, it gives me back the ith component, then that means that the total derivative of Xi is exactly the same as Xi. 
xi gives you back the ith component, well then, of whatever you give it, and dp xi gives you back the ith component of whatever you give it. So a lot of people would say, ah, it's its own, the total derivative of xi is just xi again. As I said, it's a little misleading to say that. One of those, you give it velocity vectors. The other ones, you give it points. But if you don't distinguish between vectors based at p and points, then yeah, the total derivative of a coordinate function is just itself. Um, something else that's kind of confusing enough that it's, or easy enough that it's confusing. What happens if you take just a function from R to R, like you dealt with in single variable calculus, and you take its total derivative? What, what does that give you? So suppose you've got a function from R to R. So you just give it one, you give it one number, it gives you back a number, and suppose it's differentiable at P. Um, differentiable here also means the total derivative. It's the same as saying the total derivative exists. What is the total derivative of f with respect to some velocity vector v, where now p and v are just single real numbers? Well, by the formula, you take the gradient vector of f at p, and you dot with v. Now, this is just a single number, um, and this is just the gradient vector is the vector of all the partial derivatives, but it only has one derivative. So this is just f prime at p. And dot product with just one thing in each place means product. The total derivative of a variable, a single variable function, with respect to a velocity vector v, is just you take the ordinary derivative and multiply it by v. So that's easy. Then. As one final example, and as a warm-up definition, suppose you've got a vector-valued function, um, say from R2 to R3. I'm going to look at a specific one. I want f of f of x, y is, well, first of all, I'm going to call the component functions f sub 1, f sub 2, and f sub 3. And suppose what we've really got is I pick some functions for those, x squared y, y sine x, and 5 e to the x, y. And now my question is, what should the total derivative of a vector-valued function mean? And <laughs> how do you calculate it at a particular point with respect to a particular vector? So defining what it means, uh, probably if you had the choice of how to define it, you'd define it correctly, or define it the way I'm about to, which is you just take the total derivative of each of the component functions. So d, p, v equals, well, you take the total derivative of f1 um, with respect to v, the total derivative of f2 with, at p with respect to v, and the total derivative at v of f3 with respect to v. So notice that this means that you start with a function from r2 to r3 and dpf is the same type of function. You still give it, right, if at a fixed point p, you still give it a vector um, that has as many components as f had. So it's, you still give it something in R2, and it gives you back three things. It gives you back something in R3. So yeah, if your vector-valued function goes from some subset of R2 into R3, then the, the total derivative goes from R2 into R3, except this could be some subset of R2, and this always can be any vector in R2, so all of R2. Um, all right, 
So let's pick a particular p and v and calculate for this example. I'm going to pick p is pi 1. And v is 3, 7. And I want to calculate this vector valued total derivative at the point pi 1 in the direction of, well, with respect to the velocity vector 3, 7. Oh, you just have to do three of our old calculations. It's a little annoying to have to do so many calculations, but it's not difficult. So we need three different gradient vectors. We need the, so we've got f1 of xy is x squared y. We've got f2 of xy is y sine x. <clears throat> and f3 of xy is 5e to the xy. All right, we need to calculate the gradient vectors of all of these. So the gradient vector of f1, partial, the partial derivative with respect to x, 2xy, partial derivative with respect to y, that's x squared. Um, the gradient vector of f2 is the partial derivative with respect to x, and that's y cosine of x, comma, the partial derivative with respect to y, that's sine of x. And then the gradient vector of f3, it's the partial derivative with respect to x, so we get 5e e to the xy, and then by the chain rule times the partial derivative of the exponent with respect to x. So you pick up times a y. And then the partial derivative with respect to y, if i e to x, y, now you pick up an x. So those are the gradient vectors at an arbitrary point x, y. We're at the point pi 1. So pi 1, here you get, you plug in x is pi and y is 1, you get 2 pi pi squared, the gradient vector of f2 at um, pi 1, y is 1, um, x is pi, the cosine of pi is minus 1, you get minus 1, here you get the sine of pi, that's 0, and the gradient vector of f3 at pi 1, you plug in y is 1 and x is pi, so you get 5e to the pi, and over here you get 5e to the pi times another pi. Uh, you can factor out of 5 e to the pi, the scalar multiple, times 1 pi, 5 e to the pi times 1 pi. Okay, those are the gradient vectors. So what do you get for the total derivative? Well, let's see if I can fit it in right here. What do we get for d pi 1? of the vector value function f at 3, 7. We get a vector with three components. And, and I guess while I was factoring stuff out, I could have factored a pi out of here. This is pi times 2 pi, comma pi. So we get that gradient vector dotted with 3, 7, comma, this gradient vector dotted with 3, 7, comma, and then I'll guess I'll have to go to this next line, comma, that third gradient vector dotted with 3, 7, and really, we should do this out, uh, so we get pi, and then you get times 
6 plus 7 pi. comma. Here you just get minus 3, comma, and then you get 5 e to the pi times 3 plus 7 pi. That's it. Uh, there are no units here. There were no, this wasn't a physical problem. So that's an example of what you do for a vector-valued function. It's just you have to do what you did for a real-valued function. You just have to do it as many times as there are component functions in your vector-valued function. Um, so that's, uh, that's the total derivative and a bunch of examples. It's not terribly bad, and it generalizes the partial derivative. In the next section, we're going to look at kind of the total derivative as far as kind of linear approximation goes, and it will give us a notion of the tangent plane. And then in that context, we will frequently refer to the total derivative as the differential, but I'll talk about that more when we get to it.